this is Histories and Mysteries. I'm your host, Ashley, and your other host, Jessica, and your other host, Rochelle. And on, and on today's episode, I'm going to be talking about Elizabeth Bathory, um, who's the Blood Countess, and I'm so excited. Rochelle is going to be doing her second part on DL Love Pass. Mm-hmm. Which I'm also very excited for because, damn it, I need to know. I need to know. <laughs> <laughs> and I went on that website, like the D at Love Pass website, and my husband and I were looking at the photos, and they were mortifying. Oh my They're gosh. They're very gruesome. Like, like not ugh. in like a bloody sort of way, just in like a troubling sort of way. Yeah, like the ones so where creepy. their eyeballs were missing. Like, it was just very like, oh my goodness, I can't believe they put these photos up here. Like, <laughs> holy crap. And they're very, very clear photos, too. Mm-hmm. Like, there's no mistake in what you're looking at. Yeah, and they, they just look melted. Like, I know they're frozen, but they just looked like yeah. they were melted. Like, it was really crazy. Like, they're sitting in water for a little too long yeah yeah exactly like oh super disturbing (laughs) and your story is also very disturbing so this is gonna be a very disturbing episode (laughs) true i'm really excited for the elizabeth bathory story because she is nutty me too and like i've heard this story in the past but i didn't i'm i i'm hoping i was able to find different information that i've been able to add into here that i didn't know before so i'm hoping that's the case (laughs) (laughs) but um like my angle is so bad (laughs) my face looks horrible (laughs) (laughs) at least we can see you this week exactly okay that's pretty bad too whatever (laughs) (laughs) um so my story is like super trigger and content warning Um, it's pretty gruesome. It's a shorter story, but it's gruesome and I'm sorry, but it's very fascinating. Um, and like my Vlad the Impaler episode, this is situated in Hungary, which is present day, like it's in present day Slovakia. Um, so I don't know how to pronounce anything here. Perfect. We got it's Slovakia okay. and Russia. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I tried my best. <laughs> but we'll see. So don't, don't come at me with any pronunciations because I tried my best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same. Same disclaimer as last week for my story. Uh, it's all Russian and very, yeah. very Russian. <laughs> and again, I am not at all Russian. So yeah. I tried looking at pronunciations, but I'm not even sure if I can still do them justice. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I did that as well, but like sometimes hearing it still doesn't teach you how to say it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to do that with when we went to Iceland. I tried to look up some like Icelandic words. Oh my gosh. I was like, there's no, there's no way. No way. It's very very weird because you're like, oh, I think this is what it would be. And then you look up the like the pronunciation of it later like "Mm, i said that totally wrong (laughs) and sometimes i'm just like i don't even know how to make my mouth make those noises like yeah how do i do it (laughs) exactly you need somebody to tell you like exactly how to move your mouth more so than like listening to it Mm because even listening to it sometimes you're like i don't know how they're making that at all yeah or even just like watching a person say it right and then you can see how their mouth moves and but yeah, it's very confusing some days, but... <laughs> okay, so I am going to start <laughs> before we get off the rails here. <laughs> so, on orders from King Matthias, Count... Oh, God. Uh, Count... <laughs> right off the bat. And it begins. <laughs> uh, Count Gigorgi... Gigori? I don't know. Um, Thurzo visited Cheta Castle in Hungary on December 26th, 1609 or 1610. The sources differ. Gotcha. Um, and they discovered Countess Elizabeth Bathory overseeing a torture session of young girls. Oh, God. So this is already starting off super well. <laughs> yeah. I already hate it. Just yeah. casually torturing, you know. <laughs> well, like... It's funny you said she was casually because 
When they found her, allegedly she was chewing on the mutilated and de- and dying body of a girl who was prostrate in front of her, and she was casually just sitting on a stool. Oh, yeah. oh my goodness! No. <laughs> yeah. Wait, so hold on for a second. I yes. think we just had a Canadianism, and the. <laughs> Jessica, you always type it, and I never know what it sounds like, but the O-U-U, I think Rochelle just said it. Ooh. Is it oi? <laughs> no, like, ooh, like when she, like, what do you mean? What are you talking oh. about? Like, oi would be O-I-I, and then, okay, what's O-U-U? Yeah. Ooh. ooh, it's kind of oh. O-U-U. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, she was very casual about just like eating this this girl. Like this was a legend. So yeah, take it with a grain of salt. This is from the 1600s. Um, this is how and- it starts. This is how the story starts. <laughs> this is how the story <laughs> <just> starts. Like- <laughs> <laughs> well, when you said she was chewing, I was like, oh god, where is this going? And then it just went really bad. So <laughs> <laughs> this is just to I set like- the story. <laughs> <laughs> so this is on a norm this is before it gets crazy yeah <laughs> this, i'm starting at the end and i'm working my way to the beginning oh my gosh oh gosh um <laughs> uh, so another report indicated that she had just beaten a servant girl nearly to death with a club before finally ordering a servant to stab the girl with scissors And the only reason she ordered this other servant to stab the girl to death was because she was too tired from beating her with the club. Okay. I would imagine (laughs) that is very physically demanding. Yes. So then the raiding party who stormed the castle found multiple bloodied and decaying bodies all throughout the castle and the castle grounds. She didn't even like take care of the bodies afterwards. She just left them there. She didn't care. a gradual thing or just all of a sudden there are all of these bodies around or they were like oh it's a body it's not a big deal until it got to be like 50 no it (laughs) it was very gradual um she allegedly according to her and according to records killed over 600 women oh my god oh my all women yeah wow like there are over 600 victims according to elizabeth Wow. Wow. So up until now, her high-ranking relatives had basically made what she was doing disappear because they, they're they like, you know what? We don't need this to get out into the public. We don't need our family being disgraced. We're just going to let her be. Um, She was also believed to be the first vampire in our history, which is interesting because... Vlad was like 200 years prior. Like Vlad the Impaler or Dracula. Interesting. So. Maybe they knew yeah. about her before they knew about like, potentially how bad Vlad was. Well, no, and I'll get into that later, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, who was Elizabeth Bathory? Um, she was born in Transylvania on August 7th, 1560, to a very well known and prominent family. Her one uncle was the king of Poland, and her nephew was a prince of Transylvania. And not Vlad, because he was a couple centuries before her. Gotcha. Um, While most of the members of her family were distinguished and influential, some of her family was very disturbed. Um, So basically, her uncle instructed her in Satanism, and her aunt taught her about sadomasochism. Which it's really nice. What a great uncle. childhood to have. Right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> One time my uncle dressed up as Santa. That was nice. Nice. <laughs> the opposite of our Satanism. <laughs> Santaism. Yeah. <laughs> so her uncle probably dressed up as like Krampus and yeah. <laughs> uh, right. And the mom is straight for the S and M. Uh her aunt. Her aunt. Her aunt, yes. All about pleasure from pain. (laughs) 
I mean, to each their own. To each their own, as long as they're consenting adults. Yes. <laughs> there you go. But this just kind of sets up for what's yeah. to come, unfortunately. So um, it's not that much of a surprise where she ended up no, later on. Not at all. And it's, I mean, especially during this time, right? Because, like, there were still a ton of wars going on between Hungary and um, those other people. There was, like, that big war going on. I can't remember who they were, but... <laughs> Go listen to my Dracula story. <laughs> You'll figure it out. <laughs> Hungary and the other people. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to say Hungary and Slovakia, but I think that's totally wrong. So I think you're right about that. I've been to both countries. I should know. Oh, cool. oh really? Yeah. What'd you go there for? Yeah. Uh, when I was on my exchange in university, uh, we just traveled like all over Europe. Where did oh, you do your cool. exchange? Yeah. And Leeds in England. Nice. Was there for a semester. That's fun. Yeah. I wish I that's like the one thing I regret about not doing in college is an exchange program. That was like the one thing I was like, I must do. I sacrificed a lot of stuff that I wanted to do to do it. But yeah. like, I was so happy I did. It was really cool. Yeah. I went on an exchange um, when I lived in, like, not, I lived in France for a semester when I was in high school. So oh, that's so cool. But that's cool. I was looking at pictures the other day, and I'm like, I wish I remembered most of this because I was 16, and it was prior to my concussion. So I was talking oh. to my husband about it. I'm like, I wish I remembered more of this, but I'm like, I don't remember a lot of what I did or what happened other than through pictures. He's like, oh, mm. if that was before your concussion, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I thought so I was sad. like taking a, yeah. like a ridiculous amount of photos over there, but now looking back, like I wish I took more. Yeah, like, I felt yeah. like so many at the time. Like it felt like I was being excessive. But looking back, I'm like, wow, I feel like <laughs> I don't have that many. Yeah, and like uh, I, I feel the same way. And I was also at that stage of my life where I'm like, I don't want to be in a lot of photos. I don't want to look like that weird tourist. And now yeah. I'm like, I wish I was in more photos. <laughs> yeah. Especially at 16. Yeah. Like, you really want to look cool. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. I was, how old was I? 21, I think, at the time. So, like, mm. old yeah, enough still to, do, look to cool. like, do my own thing. I still want to look cool, though. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> for sure. Okay. Tangent. Tangent <laughs> alert. Okay. But that's really cool that you got to Hungary. Yeah. Yeah. Hungary um, is beautiful. It was, like, one of the countries that none of us really knew anything about. And yeah. it was one of the ones that we all, like, really loved the most. Cool. Really? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's really cool. I'd love to go to a country that's, like, super different from America. You know, like, I went to Germany and France. And they're... And Iceland, even. They're pretty similar, you know, to, like, yeah. America, Canada type stuff. But something that's completely different would be really cool. Yeah. I ironically really want to go to Russia. <laughs> yeah. So I feel I like would... Russia is too climate like Canada, like too cold for me. Yeah. Ah, uh, I would love to go to Russia for two re One, my ancestry is Russian, so that'd be kind of cool. It looks oh, really oh, cool. Oh, cool. And two, we have this scratch off map, and Russia's huge, and it would scratch <laughs> off such a big portion of it. And like underneath is like a really pretty rainbow color. <laughs> so that's another reason I want to go to Russia. <laughs> that's really. I mean, it would make you look like you cover a lot more ground. Right? <laughs> yeah, very satisfying. That's really funny. <laughs> All right. At the age of eleven, Elizabeth became engaged to Count Ferenc. I don't know. This is a weird name. F E R E N C. F E R. -E Ferenc. It's like Frank. Ferenc. I'm gonna call Frank. him Frank. Okay. There, there we go. Frank. Perfect. Count Frank <laughs> Nadasti. Um, and he was five years older than her. Oh, Which okay. That's not too is, bad for back then. Yeah, exactly. That's a bit better for back then. Um, so at the age of 15, she married Frank, and they moved into Cheta Castle, and 10 years later, their first child was born. 10 years? That's a long time for back then to be yeah. married. Well, yeah. I think he was off um, at war a lot. Oh, okay. He was off fighting like he was a soldier, so. That makes sense. Um, they had five children in total, and only three of them survived. Oh, Which is really sad. Um, they were a very good power couple back then, and they had a lot of castles, country manor houses, and palaces in places like Prague and Vienna. So they were, Ooh. like, very well-established, very recognizable, just 
you know, rocking it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so like I said, her husband was a soldier and he was away for most of their marriage fighting. And so it's kind of understandable that this is where Bathory learned of torture and torture methods. And like obviously mixed in with her aunt's teachings as well of sadomasochism. <laughs> Uh, and in her teachings, like she's like going to school, and that's yeah. like, well, I mean, back that things are very structured. <laughs> so, just going with her books and skipping along. <laughs> um, so, in order to ensure that his wife was happy, her husband built a torture chamber for her. Oh my gosh. So and in order to make me happy, my husband put up a felt sound wall for me, not building a torture chamber. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> what wow. a good guy, Cody. <laughs> not saying it couldn't be used as a torture chamber, actually. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so her husband participated in her tortures, um, but when he died in 1604 from a disease, not battle... Um, she actually got a lot worse. And it's believed that her husband actually curved her drive for torture. Ah, got so it. He might have participated, wow. but he kind of like curved it and made sure that she was laying low, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> mm. um, but with the help <laughs> oh of a God. nurse and a local witch, Bathory began abducting peasant girls and bringing them back to her torture dungeon. Gen- torture dungeon (laughs) it's awful so i compiled a list of things that she would do to these abducted peasant girls oh no so massive trigger warning here (laughs) cringeworthy too so she would bite pieces of flesh from her victims on a regular basis so she'd just go honk chomp on her shoulder and like rip off (laughs) flesh Okay, Mike Tyson. Uh. <laughs> One poor girl was forced to cook and consume her own flesh. Oh my god. What? Yeah. She would put pins and needles under their fingernails, binding <gasps> them up, smearing honey on them, and leaving them to be attacked by bees and ants. Oh, gosh. Oh, man. I feel like I've heard that one before, but yeah. it's just as, like, awful every yeah. time you yeah. hear it. Um, she also stripped her victims naked and forced them into ice baths. Ugh. No, thanks. That, that would be the end of me right there. I cannot <laughs> yeah. handle the cold at all. Exactly. But, like, she would force them in there until they just passed away, like, until they died kind of thing. Ugh. Uh, She would cut noses or lips off and then would whip them with stinging nettles. She bit shoulders and breasts as well as burning the flesh on some victims, including their genitals with a candle. She ripped their mouths open with her own bare hands. (gasps) She used heated metal rods to poke and prod them. She beat them with whips and clubs, cutting and stabbing them. She would throw them outside in the snow with no clothes on and then proceed to throw freezing water on top of them. I hate all of this. (laughs) Uh, She would pour boiling water over them, which tear, which, wow, which tore their flesh from their bodies. (laughs) She would put these girls in barrels that had spikes inside, and then she would hoist them up and bathe in their blood that poured out. Oh my gosh. And she used the Iron Maiden as well to extract blood from her victims so that she could bathe in that blood. So... All this stuff came from testimonies from, like, her servants and stuff that watched or the people that I guess were accomplices like that were burying the bodies or whatever so oh my gosh that like gave me goosebumps yeah so Mm -hmm. yeah that's gross she just she's just a lovely where did she get the idea like where what day what time when (laughs) was she like I'm you know what I'm gonna do for fun well like later on I think I go into like very briefly but it's about like 
they kind of got these methods from the Spanish Inquisition. Oh. And that's where the torture methods, like, really became prominent, right? So they got a lot of the ideas from the Inquisition and, I mean, mixed with that sadomasochism, right? So, like, she was taught to get off from viewing the pain of other people or herself undergoing the pain. Like, it kind of works both ways, so. Yeah. So she was said to believe that drinking human blood would keep her uh, young and healthy, And her lust for bathing in blood appears to come from when a chambermaid noted some hair was out of place on Bathory's head or she, like, plucked a couple of hairs by accident when she was, like, brushing her hair or something. Um, So Bathory struck her really hard in the face and then the blood spurt onto her face and she, when she wiped it away, she's like, oh, I feel... Like, I look rejuvenated. So then that's why she would go on to kill her victims for the purpose of bathing in their blood. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Because of an accident. Mm -hmm. So, but, yeah, I don't know. (laughs) I don't know the mechanics of the days, but whatever. (laughs) This is just horrible either way (laughs) yeah um the mechanics of bathing in blood however seems a bit far-fetched considering liquid blood quickly coagulates and becomes sticky which isn't very suitable for bathing that's true that's a good point yeah so these rumors of her bathing in blood also somewhat suggest that she was into witchcraft which we all know wasn't great and i'm also going to kind of go a little further into it a bit later too but yeah, it's it's weird because like you see all these shows and stuff where people are like bathing in blood and everything, but it's like yeah, their blood coagulates very quickly. Like it just doesn't make any sense. So, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, and I never heard that before. So that yeah, I never thought about that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they never really show like bathing in like clots. Yeah, exactly. chunky blood. Ew. <laughs> <laughs> it's so gross. Ew, and I'm having spaghetti tonight. Ew. That's what I want to picture now. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> oh, it's so oh, gross. Gosh. Ew. Alright, we're going to move on from this. <laughs> <laughs> Despite these horrible crimes and the many women going missing, her family was head of the local government, so she was ignored until around 1610. Um, so back in the day... Disciplining one servant to death was considered uh, was considered unnecessarily cruel and impolite in the 1600s, <laughs> but it remained an aristocrat's prerogative if they dis- like if they wished to do so. Okay, so it wasn't illegal, but it was kind of like frowned upon. Yeah, it's like you know what if you're gonna do that, go into the back room and do it. Like don't do it where people can see you, kind of thing. <laughs> oh my gosh. It was just impolite. Yes. <laughs> wow. Um, So 25 young women from diminishing minor noble families were invited to stay at Elizabeth's castle the year before her capture. Some of these minor aristocratic families were delighted to send their daughters to Elizabeth, hoping that an affiliation with the countess would boost their family's reputation. However, some of the girls disappeared during their stay. Surprise, surprise. So she's not just going after peasant girls anymore. Um, As worried parents inquired about their daughter's whereabouts, the countess informed them that one of the other girls had murdered them for their jewels and then committed suicide. When the family demanded the girl's body, Elizabeth declined, claiming that a suicide fatality had to be buried unmarked on unconsecrated ground right away. Other multiple deaths, she said, were caused by disease outbreaks, and the fear of infectious panic was the justification for secretly burying those victims. I mean, that's not a bad excuse. Yeah, she... I mean, yeah, she had it covered, didn't she? Yeah, she she had it locked down, which was just... It's fascinating. It's horrible, but it's fascinating. And, like, how many people... How many people who are around and, like, knew that was going on? Yeah. Um, yeah. A lot of people. Just knew. So, at this point, King Matthias said enough was enough when Bathory began abducting girls from the noble families. 
And so throughout 1610, Parliament's investigators gathered evidence against Elizabeth from a wide range of witnesses, both noble and peasant. Which is good that they're kind of involving everybody. Mm -hmm. (laughs) In January 1611, Bathory and her accomplices were up for trial on 80 counts of murder. Bathory's family, being as prominent as they were, were mortified at this discovery. Just mortified. (laughs) I'm sure. So much so that Bathory wasn't allowed to show her face at her own trial, and her family immediately had all of the records closed up. Oh my gosh. Her trial... She wasn't allowed to, like, be seen on her own trial no, or just, like, have her She wasn't face. allowed to go to her own trial because her family didn't want anybody seeing her and knowing that something was going on. Wow. Well, if she's having a trial, I think they know that something's <laughs> no, going on. No, because they kept the records locked up from the public, like, immediately uh, okay. upon the trial being over. And back then, the trial was over in, like, one to three days. They just, like, immediately locked everything up and just put it behind. So they knew there was, like, a trial, but they didn't know who. Yeah, and they kind of just, like, put the records behind, like, an iron curtain and was like, okay, these are just locked up forever now. Gotcha. Um, so her trial was kind of conspiratorial because the Hungarian king owed money to Elizabeth's late husband, and this debt would then be owed to her. But if she was executed, the debt wouldn't be paid out to her surviving family members, but wow. instead it would simply be canceled. So like if she's committed of, she's committed, oh my goodness, if she's convicted. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Convicted. <laughs> I saw the brain the brain wheels turning and you're like, what am I trying to say? <laughs> Just had a mini stroke, it's okay. <laughs> if she was convicted of a crime, her family couldn't receive anything that she was owed and they couldn't get any of her property. Oh. So yeah. our good pal Prince Thurzo, who was from the beginning of the story, who raided her castle. Um, He was related by marriage to Elizabeth's family, so this affected him. So basically, this guy rigged the trial in such a way as to ensure that the family received the property and debts owed to Elizabeth. Um, There are some that believe that the story of Elizabeth and her crimes is kind of made up, um, fabricated by her family in order to seize her property and debts owed. Uh, and they were kind of playing on the fact that, you know, she could be a witch and like the hysteria of the time and all this kind of stuff. So interestingly, though, four of her servants were interviewed using methodology from the Inquisition. The uh, same questions were asked of each servant separately and then cross indexed and compared, wherein they were charged, as mentioned above. Um. I don't know why I said as mentioned above. As mentioned previously, holy mackerel. <laughs> um, <laughs> their testimonies were used as evidence against Elizabeth during her trial. And they indicated that Elizabeth would torture her servants over any small infraction. And Elizabeth was always present during the tortures. Everyone was convicted and sentenced to death except for Bathory because her family didn't want her making an appearance at a public execution. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, two. Wow. Yeah, this is just wild. Um, two, <laughs> two female servants were sentenced to have their fingers ripped off with hot pincers before being <laughs> thrown into a fire alive. Oh. Mm. Because of his youth, the male servant was sentenced to be decapitated and his body thrown into the flames. Oh. The fourth depend the fourth defendant was acquitted and vanished from the records. Nobody know what happened to her. Oh. And a fifth was later retrieved and also executed and they just never mentioned how. Their executions uh-huh. sound like something she would have done. Like yeah. Those were horrible. Yeah. yeah. Like having your fingers ripped off. At least the guy who got decapitated died yeah. before he was yeah. thrown You're into not the like... flames. The girl got her fingers Ugh. ripped off. And then burned alive. Like, how horrible. Yeah. Ugh. Ugh. 
Upon the conclusion of her trial, Thurzo was the one to condemn Elizabeth, saying, quote, well, this is like translated quote, but whatever. <laughs> um, you, Elizabeth, are like a wild animal. You are in the last months of our life. You do not deserve to breathe the air on earth, nor to see the light of the Lord. You shall disappear from this world and shall never reappear in it again. The shadows will envelop you and you will find time to repent your bestial life. I condemn you, Lady of Chate. Chat? Chate? How did I say it earlier? Chata. Sorry. <laughs> they said it. They spelled it differently here. <laughs> um, Lady of Chata to a lifelong imprisonment in your own castle. Unquote. Oh. But. No, oh, no. It's that's... not as good as it sounds. <laughs> Okay. So she was sentenced <laughs> to a room in the castle that only had a slit for air and food. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's better. So she uh, wasn't, like, living it up in her castle. <laughs> uh, because of her elevated rank, she couldn't be imprisoned as a common criminal. So that's kind of why they did this. And she wasn't executed because her family wanted to get her money and stuff. <laughs> well, um, she wow. lasted three years in this like little room in her castle before she was found dead on August 21st, 1614 at the age of 54. Wow. And as she was not convicted of any crimes, Elizabeth's property moved to her surviving family members rather than being confiscated, which leads some to believe that some of the story was embellished so that her family could control her property, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, she has earned a Guinness World Record for the most prolific female murderer, reputed to having killed at least 600 victims. What a good world record to hold. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and miraculously, we may have never heard of Elizabeth Bathory if it weren't for a Jesuit scholar named Father Laszlo Tarowski. I don't know. Rokes. Uh, who cares? Um, <laughs> in 1720, Father Laszlo discovered the trial records and restored this legendary and gruesome woman into history. Further, in the 1970s, a college professor named Raymond T. McNally was researching for a book on Dracula, and in doing so, he gained access to rare Hungarian and Romanian archives that had still been locked up. Wow. So he was our like he already knew about Dracula and he was looking for information to write a book on him, but he was actually able to locate original documents from the trial of Bathory. Wow. And it's cool. super yeah. cool. And upon finding this research, he then wrote the book Dracula was a woman in the search of the blood countess of Transylvania. And that's wow. by Raymond T. McNally, Ooh. if anybody wants to try and find it and read it. <laughs> Uh, fun fact, in the trial records, there was no mention of blood bathing whatsoever. Oh. And this bathing in blood thing was found out to be a complete myth and thought to have come about due to the fact that she was covered in her victim's blood after torturing and murdering them. So, like, oh. uh, the blood spatter, right? Oh. Got so, it. um... And I forgot to do my sources. <laughs> <laughs> so I used history.com, biography.com, serialkillershistory.wordpress.com, and a website called Rejected Princesses. Um, <laughs> and that is my story on The Blood Countess. Thanks. I hated it. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. Always here to... Please. <laughs> <laughs> or destroy. That's just nuts. <laughs> oh, that's oh crazy. Oh my god. Yeah. So she was just... The fact that her family for so long just knew and they were like, eh, it's fine. Yeah, do? and it's crazy because I, I left it out because it was just kind of whatever, but like a monk or a priest or whatever from the village started seeing all these bodies kind of like piling up and he kind of made a petition for something to happen to her and that's kind of how King Matthias got involved but she just like threw her victims outside of the castle like all willy-nilly like she just didn't care so wow. yeah. can you imagine being like that like bold about it just like murdering people and throwing them outside your house well it was just impolite right so yeah. 
it wasn't frowned upon until she started going after noble women and then it was uh, yeah. kind of an issue right so yeah wow but, yeah <sighs> That's ballsy of her to just do, be like, oh, peasant women aren't enough for me anymore. Yeah. Why don't I oh, yeah. go she for the people that are actually going to be looked for? Yeah, yeah, she was crazy. But, I mean, how much of it is, like, true and how much of it is false, right? So, yeah. But yeah. it's still a crazy story. So, uh, yeah. yeah, I didn't know a lot. Like, I knew most of it, obviously, but, like, I didn't know some of it. So, yeah, it was cool. But I should have tried to see if I like could find like cool, ghost yeah. stories from the castle, but I forgot. <laughs> oh yeah, that'd be really cool. I'll we can do it on one of our ghost features of the week. <sighs> true. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, true, yeah, we could. Okay, I'm like dying in here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, are you ready to hear about what actually happened or what they think actually happened on the mountain? Okay. So my sources are pretty similar to my sources from last week. It was mm, largely that DiatloPass.com yeah. uh, website that just has absolutely everything you would ever want to know about There's this There's so uh, much on there. And then I looked at a couple Nat Geo articles too, and I think there was an article from the Star, the Toronto cool. Star actually. And then the one that you sent me, Jessica, which nice. I looked at before, and I can't remember what it was. <laughs> um, but maybe I'll find that. We could put it in the show notes. <laughs> <All right. laughs> okay, so where did we leave off last week? We were talking about some of the different theories. Yeah, and you left us at um, a big as to what they thought. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I did. Okay, so just to recap, in 1959, nine hikers went missing in the Ural Mountains in Russia, and they all turned up dead. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> Surround sound. Uh, so, to go over some of the theories, the possibility is that many people have thought could be the answer um, of what actually happened at Dyatlov Pass. Uh, the first theory, a few of the hikers were KGB, which is a Russian equivalent of the CIA agent on a mission to uncover a cell of American CIA agents. Boo. But something went wrong, and they killed the entire group. Didn't like that one. Ashley was not <laughs> no. a fan of that one. <laughs> um, the hikers were mistaken for gulag fugitives and killed. No. <laughs> I feel like from the photos, I don't think you'd think those people were gulag no. fugitives. If you've gone to look at the photos, they look like lovely, fun Mm -hmm. people to me. Um, The hikers got caught in a Russian military testing site and exposed to radiation. I hate that one. Which might explain the radiation found on their clothing, but it also might be because they went to a school. Mm -hmm. And that one guy was exposed to, like, a really big radiation disaster. So depending on how... My husband has a theory, and I'll say it afterwards. Okay. okay. That just reminded okay. me. <laughs> um, were they killed by the local Manzi tribe, which is people that live in the mountains? I, I liked there, that one. And they're known for sacrifice. Hmm. Although I should say they weren't known for human sacrifice, but this could be a new thing for them. Um, tripping on shrooms. I like that one. I like that one. one. <laughs> <laughs> I liked that one. Okay, Jessica likes that one, actually. (laughs) Not into that one. Um, Spotted UFOs and were killed by aliens is, I think, my Mm -hmm. favorite theory. (laughs) Um, Especially if you've gone on the website and you've seen some of the pictures that were taken from some of the cameras, and we'll get into that in a bit. Um, They were hit by Soviet rocket launches. No, stupid. I hate that one. (laughs) There wouldn't be any of them left. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> infrasound caused them to flee and succumb to the weather. So infrasound is like sound that we cannot hear as humans, but can like cause symptoms of panic and hysteria yeah, in people. I like that. And so the theory is that they were exposed to that and they caught that hysteria or whatever. And then that caused them. To They're probably attack. on shrooms. And then that sound hit them and it just... And then they saw the aliens and then didn't hear the sound, and so they went running. I definitely like that as, like, a part of it. You know what I mean? Like, it's somewhere in there. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense as to why they just, like, 
left without any thinking to leaving. Mm -hmm. Like, they didn't take all of the proper clothes, the equipment. They cut themselves out of the yeah. tent. So, like, why? Um, and especially if, like, there's nothing around them, when the rescuers went to find, like, went to found them, well, <laughs> went to find them, it wasn't obvious what had happened. So why, if it was, like, something like a rocket launch, like you said, you would have seen them splattered yeah, or like just nice. disintegrated or like or, more yeah or like a yeah, big crater yeah. you would think right so yeah or it's just something more obvious than just like they cut their out of their tent for no yeah. reason yeah I think. um a yeti was it a yeti i like that oh, one didn't too. you like that one rochelle you liked the yeti i do i like that one too because like who's who's to say that there's not one? We've never seen one. True. It could be some sort of bear wolf hybrid thing, human hybrid out there. We have no true, idea. True, true. Dunno. <laughs> um <laughs> They were caught in a teleportation. I like that one too. I thought that one was pretty cool. That one was yeah. really cool. Imagine, maybe like time time traveling or that i ke they kept talking in some of the articles about like the older guy samen zolotaryov or whatever who was like older and mysterious but they never said why yeah, he was mysterious i, like, I want to know why maybe because he was from the Ooh, future okay and then i don't know maybe um hit by lightning or ball lightning in the area which i think you would have also seen more yeah there'd like, be more evidence of it i feel yeah yeah um problems at the tent stove i think you would have seen more damage with the tent mm -hmm. for that one or you just like shut it yeah. off yeah yeah uh gravity fluctuation that one's weird yeah i feel like how is there have we had instances of gravity fluctuation on no, earth I before i I haven't heard yeah. of it. Maybe, maybe. Um, catabatic slash falling wind. So that's when like the wind comes down the mountain at like such extreme speeds that it can basically like cause an avalanche, basically destroy a lot of things in its I like path. that one too, mixed with so some other that things. That could be part yeah. of it too. Yeah. Um Wolverine. <laughs> I know you guys like this one. one. <laughs> 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 I mean, I don't think there was, like, a, an animal attack rather than, like, they got scavenged afterwards. Yeah. And that's why they had eyeballs and tongues and stuff yeah. missing. But, like, the idea of a wolverine attack sounds yeah. scary. But then again, like, why were they cutting their way out of the tent if they were... Yeah, you, you wouldn't... Unless the wolverine somehow got in the tent with them, which... In the yeah. tent first, yeah. Like, surprise, surprise, wolverine. Um, <laughs> surprise you Chapman oh I like that uh, surprise <laughs> my mom would love that I said that, that last week uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> menthol poisoning which we couldn't figure out like where that would come from well I mean they could have been smokers I don't know yeah they have like matches and stuff in their pockets yeah. but but, like, why all of a sudden, if they were, like, smokers, why all of a sudden would the menthol get to them? You know what I mean? Maybe with the altitude? I don't know. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, Arctic hysteria. I could see that playing into it. Which I guess is just, yeah, like, when you're out there for too long, it gets to your head. Um, death by snowmobile? That one's yeah, stupid. Like that one. <laughs> Although I did like, like picturing the, snowmobile the Yeti coming from? driving the snowmobile. The Yeti on the yeah. snowmobile. <laughs> Hitting them all. <laughs> I like that one. Uh, I mean, if a Yeti were to drive anything, I'm sure it would be <laughs> yeah. snowmobile. You got tired. And then finally, avalanche. Which I feel like has to be part of yeah. it. Because... Like, some of them were found covered, but, I mean, they could have been covered. Yeah, like, a lot of snowfall, right? Who knows? Yeah. Okay. So, these are just a few of the theories surrounding what might have happened to the hikers that fateful day, but what really happened? 
They think they finally figured oh, it out. I had another theory, though. They think they finally figured it out. Oh, yeah, Jessica, what was uh, Kyle's theory? Yeah? Oh, okay. yeah, you have so, a theory. So, my husband was saying, because most of them were engineering students, right? So they could yep. have been playing with something radioactive. Like, that's why they went up into the mountain in the middle of nowhere with nobody uh. around. And they could have been trying to, like, fidget with something and set something off. And something went wrong, and that's kind of why some of them had burns, and some of them had their eyeballs missing, and, you know, but I don't know. Interesting. Ooh. Yeah, I guess it never really said why they were going that yeah. way they were going. And, like, that might be, like, that's why some of them were missing their eyeballs or their tongue, and some of them weren't, and some of them had burns on them, and... Yeah, the one had, like, a burn yeah. on his hand, but, like, didn't have burns yeah, anywhere and something else. could have gone wrong. Who knows? But And that might have, like, accounted for why some of them had the radioactive stuff on them. Interesting. Okay. Mm. But who knows? That sounds like a, yeah, that sounds like a plausible theory, too. Hmm. All right. Well, first off, I want to talk about some of the strange things that were found near and around the site when the hikers were found. So not only did they find the bodies, but they actually found, like, other things that were odd okay. as well, like the tent itself. So there's a lot of questions surrounding why the hikers pitched their tent in the spot that they did, because it was not a spot that like a group of experienced hikers should have picked to set up camp for the night like it didn't really make sense that way so the first theory about why they camped where they did is that on january 31st the group arrived at the edge of a highland area and began to prepare for their climb so they wanted to lighten their load a little bit because they were going to go climb up like a steeper part of the mountain. So they bury a cache in the wooded valley that included food and equipment that they were going to use on their way back down the mountain when they were going to finish their trip. So they didn't actually have to carry mm-hmm. like everything with them the whole time. So on the next day, the hikers start to move up through the pass, and it seems they plan to get over the pass. So, like, the idea is that they're going to hike until they get over the pass and then make their camp on the opposite okay. side. Um, so they were, like, originally going to go farther than they did, but the weather was getting really bad, and they were losing visibility, and they ended up losing which direction they were going and then heading west towards the top of the mountain because that was one of the only things that they were probably able to see. Um, and when they realized they had made a mistake, the group decided to stop and set their tent up, um, right there on the slope of the mountain rather than moving downhill to a forested area, um, which would have made more sense because there would have been some shelter down okay. there. Whereas they decided to just stop in the middle of the mountain slope where there was absolutely no sort of shelter, anything around. Totally not what an experienced group of hikers like this. Yeah, and they were like badass hikers. Like you would assume that they would know what was going on. Yeah, they all survived crazy things. Like the one girl got bit by a viper. The other guy chased a bear down with a hammer. Um, Oh, the other girl got shot by a hunter that was on the trip with them. Um, And it's all this kind of camping trip and they're all like let's do it again so as we've been going through this i've been kind of like going through the post-mortem photos just to like i'm listening to you and looking at the photos and yeah did you ever mention um semian zolotarov his it looks like his nose is missing no she didn't does it? No, I didn't mention that. He's the older, mysterious oh, okay. Man. Yeah, his body is really fucked up. That's weird. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, sorry. He was also one, though, that they found with, like, more... Oops. Found with more clothing on than other ones. <laughs> um, as the other guy that was found near him, so they think they were actually, like, outside... The tent when disaster struck, and I think that's part of why there are these theories surrounding those ones being the ones that, like, went crazy and killed the rest of the group or were secret CIA agents and killed the gotcha. rest of the group. Okay, yeah. Sorry, I just saw his, like, last photo, and it, he, his body is really, really fucked up. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's also because he was he was also one of the ones that was found later, um... Okay. In the second round. 
Um, so he was out there gotcha. for longer. Um, okay. So the second theory as to why they pitched their tent in the spot that they did is that they were seeing that the sun was started to uh, sun was starting to go down, and they wanted to set their tent up and get their camp ready before it got dark. So the sun was going down a lot faster than they expected it to. Um, and they still didn't know exactly why uh, Igor Dyatlov, the leader, decided to pitch the tent where they did. So it's still a kind of up in the air question as to why did they do that. It's not a smart mm-hmm. spot for a hiker to set up camp. And they should have known better that this is what they did. Gotcha. Like... So there was nothing suspicious regarding the actual tent, more so the way that where it was camped. So they weren't suspicious of the fact that they cut themselves out of the tent or the tent itself. The only suspicious thing is that the hikers did actually cut themselves yeah. out of it instead okay, of using yeah. the door. That is very odd. Okay. So, yeah. Like what's fast like i feel like unzipping a tent or i don't know how the tent was uh it might have been buttons but like still getting the door open what was going on that made them think that that wasn't yeah, fast enough yeah. cuz that's like i mean you got to be in a really big hurry to cut your tent because once you cut it you can't use it again i mean you can but true true yeah I mean, it'd be a lot... Well, the amount of, like, slices out of it, it would have been quite a lot yeah. of repair. So they were, like, well, not even on their minds that they weren't going to be able right, to use yeah. it again. Okay. So another one of the theories is that they were killed by the Manzi tribe. So that's, like, the natives that live in the mountain range there. Um, and the theory is that the hikers were killed by them... Uh, because they entered their hunting grounds. So there was also... So the theory is that they were killed by the local Manzi tribe because they unknowingly entered their hunting okay. grounds. So there was also a chum slash Manzi tent northeast from where the group pitched their tent on the night of January 30th. So there was um, like a Manzi tent very close by to where they're interesting tent okay and there was a trail that led to the tent and it passed by the hikers tent only by 200 feet so it was like right yeah. now interesting. Their tent. so that kind of makes sense but a local man who lived in the area next to the man's eye all of his life said that their traditions and beliefs say that the chum is what they call the tent is a place of sacrifice. Oh. And there was one really close to the hiker's tent and a trail that passed by 200 feet to the hiker's tent. Interesting. Huh. So Oops. they were only set to do like animal sacrifices, not human sacrifices. But if a group of humans were trespassing on their hunting grounds. Yeah. Maybe they didn't like that. Don't know. Okay. So there were also axes found. So the group was only um, reported as having one axe, but two were found near the tent. Yeah. Where did the other axe come from? Was it not reported and they always had two? Did it show up? Was it one of the rescuers? Okay. Okay. Where did that extra yeah. axe come from? Okay, so this next one has to do with um, the bodies themselves, so the liver mortis spots, like the bruises and okay. bruising found on the bodies. So the position of some of those liver mortis spots found on the bodies didn't particularly match the way the bodies yeah. were laid out. So this means there's a possibility that the bodies were moved or turned over after their death. This can maybe be disproven because liver mortis and frozen cadavers change color when they get warm. So like when they're taken out of their cold, they go from purple to light red and then eventually they go really dark again. So that could explain why they don't really match up. But still, like if they were moved, was it? 
the people that were still living part of the group moving like the people that died first was it whoever killed the entire group moving them positioning them was it just the fact that they were in and out of the cold yeah huh like what's going on there Okay, and then the photos. So, a couple of the campers were carrying cameras with them, and we know that C- Saman Zolotarov had a camera mm-hmm. on him um, when he was found, even though the film got all destroyed by water, which is so annoying, because can you imagine the answer to this is probably, like, on the camera. Yeah, especially because he was the last one that they think was, you know. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So there are a few odd photos found on some of the cameras that the hikers were carrying. So the first photo is Slobo Din and the bird okay. jacket. So there's a picture where one of the hikers is posing in a burnt quilted jacket that we know does not oh. belong to him after reading a diary entry by oh, one of the girls. Okay. So it's assumed that the jacket belonged to one of the other hikers. Oh. But who does it belong to? And did to? he have that on after the other hiker died? I, yeah, I don't know. We don't know when yeah. the picture was taken, right? Ooh. Okay. Eek. Uh, so the picture number two is called Frame 34, and it was a photo that was discarded until recently as evidence because it's just not that good of quality. It's, like, okay. super blurry. Um. But it's a very dark picture with two blurry yep, glowing right orbs. Now. Yeah, so this photo lends itself to the theory that the UFOs are responsible for the killing of the hikers. They're saying that the orbs are the UFOs? Yeah, or whatever was coming down to kill them. So, like, the blast from the rocket launches, if that's the theory you want to follow, the UFOs, if that's the hmm. theory that you this like. This, to me... Either this to me way. just looks more like a camera mistake. Yeah. And that's why they didn't want to use it as evidence because it's yeah. just bad quality. Yeah. It's not a good picture. Um, so there's controversy surrounding um, if some of the camera slash film was taken from the tent by members of the mm-hmm. search party. Um, so like maybe there's stuff okay. missing. Um, and we don't know because the rescuers found it, just took it, uh, maybe trying to like cover up something that they knew, maybe for a souvenir. Interesting. I don't, mm, I don't know. Um, but it's known that Zolotaryov, um, and Tebow, so those were the two that were found together and they were found mm-hmm. better clothed than the other hikers. Um, so he took the camera with him that night. So there's a possibility that whatever chased the group out of the tent didn't see Zolotaryov or Tebow, and unfortunately the film was destroyed by water. Mm. So, like, there's a chance that they saw whatever was going on. Gotcha. Because they were outside the tent okay. when it happened. So, like, that's the kind of shitty thing about that film being destroyed. Yeah by water is because if they were outside of the tent and they saw that happening, there's a good chance he, like, started yeah, clicking pictures yeah. of it. Ugh. And we're never gonna see. Hmm. Okay. So the radioactive clothes. Studies showed that there were abnormally high readings for radioactivity on Dubonina's brown sweater, so that's one of the girls, and Kolotov's pants and sweater okay. waistband. So these clothes could not be contaminated above normal level by normal circumstances without having been in the presence of a radioactive contaminated place. Huh. So, like, the levels of radioactivity were way too high to be, like, That's a weird. coincidence. Like, something had to have happened yeah. radioactive. Well, and I, like, like I said, I love my husband's theory because, like, if they were playing with something radioactive like that, that could account for why they were kind of, like, melted on the inside. Yeah. Right? Like, that big blast. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they were totally crushed yeah. on the inside. Okay. I think they said it was, like, the force of if they got hit by Oof. an SUV. Which is insane. Okay, so the Yeti theory. Um, according to the book of uh, according to the book Mountain of the Dead by Keith McCloskey, one of the group had written on a piece of paper, 
Now we know snowmen oh. exists. Oh. What? <laughs> what? Did they see one? Um, so this could be a quote written in a newspaper uh, that the students had with them. So they had a newspaper with them that had the quote, from now on we know that the snowman exists. Okay. So is that what they were up there for? Were they searching for a Yeti? Huh. Okay. And they found <laughs> one, maybe? Ah. And there is that photo. I don't know if you've like if you've seen it yet, Ashley, if you're on that page. Um, but there is a picture from one of their cameras that looks suspiciously yeah, okay. like a Yeti. So I saw that one and I was like, this is what they're using as the Yeti photo. But if you look at the picture right yeah. before it, there's a picture of a guy, um, like he's bending over doing something. And then I'm pretty sure that that's him in the next picture because he has a hood on and he's got a hood on in that yeah, one. Yeah, it's just like they're, he's all dressed yeah, up. Yeah, it's just really blurry. So stuff. I think it's just him, but, you know, who knows? Mm, why would they write that, though? Like, yeah. who's who's writing that in their diary? Well, this was back in, not... like, the 50s, 60s, right? <sighs> Yeah, yeah, so 59. I mean, they're probably hopped up on some type of drug or <laughs> like <laughs> yeah, they're exactly. on the shrooms. <laughs> yeah, or they could have just had like that paranoia, right, from being out in like the middle of nowhere. Like, yeah. I don't know, or the elevation. I don't know how high yeah. up they were. Yeah, and your brain can make okay. you hear and see yeah, things. Yeah, exactly. You know for sure. Yeah, so I think that's all part of the like Arctic yeah. hysteria theory. Is that they all just kind of went nuts because they were in too much of gotcha. bad conditions to sustain. So what really happened? So I got this information from Nation.com. And I think that was what the maybe the one that you sent me, Jessica. I don't remember. Um, but an article by the journal Communications Earth and Environmental Environment Research. <laughs> Ooh, an article by the journal... Communications, Earth, and Environment Researchers. Got That's it. That's a journal title. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very long journal title. But an article by that journal presented data pointing to the likelihood that a really small delayed avalanche might have been responsible for the horrific injuries and deaths of the nine hikers. So many people still argue that the avalanche theory doesn't quite add up. But the theory as it stands as to kind of what went down on the mountain uh, is as follows, still up in the air. It's not like 100% this is what happened. This is just what seems to be most likely. So the poor visibility made it look like the slope they were camped on wasn't as steep as it actually was. So, in reality, it was about 30 degrees, which is the minimum requirement for an avalanche. So, they were actually on a slope that met the requirement for an avalanche, even though it might not have looked like it to them, just because the visibility was absolutely awful. The weather was horrible that night. So, although the team had recorded that there was no snowfall the night, that night, there was very, very strong winds. So, back to that catabatic winds, the falling winds, heavy clumps of frigid air could have brought large amounts of snow down the mountain towards the campsite. Okay. So, computer simulations showed that the avalanche wouldn't have been big, perhaps the size of an SUV. So, the size, which kind of makes sense because that's what the damage would have been equated to, like being hit by something Mm -hmm. the size of an SUV. So this could have been why no evidence for an avalanche was found during the initial okay. investigation. And it makes sense then why you would it could have cut like, the tent up to get out of the way. Yeah, exactly. Um, especially if they like, well, they're starting to feel mm-hmm. it like fall down. Or if you're, like someone's them. outside and they're like, oh my gosh, there's an avalanche, you know, and they're like, oh gosh. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Well, those two guys, yeah. they think were outside the tent, so they could have been like, get the frick out yeah. of there now. Um, but still, if the collapse was that small, then what caused, like, all of the traumatic injuries? Because there was more than just, like, the force of mm-hmm. being hit. 
Um, the way the researchers figured out how the hikers got their injuries is probably the most interesting fact about the oh. entire investigation. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool. So a few years ago, one of the researchers was really impressed by how well the movement of snow was depicted in the oh. Disney movie Frozen. <laughs> hmm. So the animators at the Walt Disney Company and researchers of the Dyatlov Pass incident modified the film's snow animation code to make an avalanche simulation oh. model. So like they used the same way they animated the Frozen movie to basically build... That is a model so cool. of the past with snow that moves <laughs> in like the proper way. So that would help them simulate the impact of the avalanche would have had on the human body. They then took research from a 1970s General Motors oh. accident test used to calibrate the safety of seat belts to determine how much force would be needed to cause the injuries okay, on the hikers. So the fact that some of the cadavers used in the accident testing were braced with rigid supports and some were not, they ended up being really helpful in the investigation. So the fact that they did that seatbelt test with cadavers that were both just like floppy and braced up against something rigid came in handy when trying to figure out mm -hmm. the force, um, how much force is needed to cause the injuries on the hikers. In the tent, the hikers placed their bedding on top of their skis. So they were laying down against a really rigid okay. surface. So this meant that the avalanche that fell in their sleep struck an unusually rigid target. And those GM cadaver experiments could be used to calibrate the impact really precisely. So they could get exactly the amount of force it would have taken to cause the injuries. Like, exactly which is super cool. So they found that an avalanche carrying a snow block about the size of an SUV could easily break the ribs and skulls of people sleeping on a rigid bed. The injuries would have been very severe, but not immediately fatal. Okay, because I was just going to ask, but if they were in their bed and they got hit, mm -hmm. why would they have then got tried to get out of the tent? But that makes sense if they were still alive. Well, and they could have been very disoriented. Yeah, so it would have yeah. been enough to like cause fatal injuries but it wouldn't have killed them right away so they would have had enough to be like oh shit i gotta get out of here time to okay get out of here before they really yeah. realize that they're hurt which explains why like some of them had skull fractures some of them had like their like their insides okay. just totally crushed but, like if you didn't hit the heart or whatever i guess you're still well yeah they could have like a lot bit? of internal bleeding probably yeah Exactly, yeah. So, what happened after the avalanche is still a bit of a mystery. So, the current working theory is that the team cut themselves out of the, um, out of the smothered tent in a panic, fleeing towards temporary shelter in a forest that was a mile or so downslope, which is where they should have done their tent in the first place. But whatever mm -hmm. happened, happened, and they didn't. So three of them were very severely injured, but they were all found outside of the tent, so it's likely that they were dragged out. So if their injuries were that severe, they might not have been able to get themselves out, but the people mm -hmm. that might have been outside the tent or not hit as hard okay. could have dragged them out. But somebody was good enough yeah, to cut the okay. tent or think to cut the tent because it was gotcha. cut from the inside. Interesting. Okay. Hmm. Uh, the majority of the nine hikers died from hypothermia, while the others most likely died from their injuries. They're still unsure as to why some of the bodies were so oddly dressed. So, like, if you remember, some of them had, like, three socks on one foot and no socks mm -hmm. on the other foot. Or, like, one of the girls had a sweater wrapped around her feet to try and save them from mm -hmm. basically falling off. Uh, some of them had, like, other people's clothes on. So it was just, like, a mismatch of odd clothes. Um, but par paradoxical undressing is the most likely okay. explanation for that. So, like, that's where you just feel mm -hmm. like you're burning up well, instead of too, freezing. Like, like you start to take everything really disoriented off. And, like, and then also, like, you know, if, say, there were people in the tent 
and they you know died and then the people outside the tent that weren't as hurt were still alive they would need some of that clothing because now their tent's screwed so yeah exactly um and that may make sense to you as to why like salmon and tebow or whatever had a lot more clothes so it could have been that they were just outside before and already like dressed in their clothes or they were mm-hmm. the last ones to live and they had taken everybody else's clothes. Um, but yeah, they were, I think I was talking about last week, um, the fact that they did start taking clothes yeah. off of the people who died first, yeah. just to try to save themselves. Um, yeah. must have been yeah, I can't awful to have to do. <sighs> So the missing eyeballs and tongue of some of the victims might have simply been a result of scavenging animals, but it's still up in the air. They still don't know for sure. Researchers are aware that the current explanation is still very straightforward (laughs) and vague, which it is. Um, But for a lot of people to accept that, uh, because an avalanche just seems Mm -hmm. too normal, especially for everything that went on just to say like it was an avalanche just kind of like oh yeah i mean it's wanted to be yeah, something it's like a ufo as cool, but it does make sense well now that I, you, I like, think it's just it like out. a combination yeah. of a bunch of stuff too right like yeah. it could be a little tiny avalanche mixed yeah with, exactly you know a bunch of other stuff so yeah i honestly don't sure. think it's just one thing i think it was just a combination of different things and I still think there's oh, something probably. they're hiding. It's <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. It's too very much like this linear. Like this is what happened. The avalanche, blah blah blah. For all of the like other strange things, like that oh, axe yeah. one. Like where did the other axe come from? Like stuff like that. Like what is actually on the film on his camera? Yeah, it's Russia in the fifties. Especially because yeah. they kept calling him mysterious. Like, they were all like, this older guy yeah. is really mysterious. They probably have the the film, and they just don't want us to know. Like Jessica said, it's Russia in the 50s. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, there's definitely yeah. something else going on there. But this is like, how do we get people yeah. to stop talking about yeah. it? Solution. Interesting. So... Yeah. So even to this day, Dale of Pass seems to be a bit of a mystery. I, I want to know. And that ends part two. I know. It's I know. still so unsatisfying because you're like, uh, well, we we'll could have figured that one out on ourselves. Like, I wish one of them. Well, I mean, I wish all of them would have survived, obviously. But like, I wish there was someone that knew. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if the survivor knows, like, the one guy that, that went home early. I wonder if he knows the real reason they went up on that mountain. Like, maybe he knows that they were up there, like, going for and a Yeti or why, going like, for... He, maybe he felt fine, but he was like, I don't I don't like this, or, yeah. I can't do yeah. this like, anymore, maybe yeah. Maybe, like, Jessica or Kyle said, you know, maybe they were messing with something that they, like, radiation-wise that they shouldn't have been. And he's like, nah, man, I'm not down for that. Like, do we know why Yuri turned around and, like, didn't go up the mountain? It just says Uh-oh. poor health conditions. Okay. Like, he wasn't feeling well. But, yeah, it could it could have been something like that. Like, I would have probably, especially, like, he knew what these people yeah, had been yeah. through before. Like, they're not scared of anything. Especially that one guy who just grab a hammer and chase it down the mountain. Like, <laughs> Oh, gosh, yeah. Wow, yeah. what a cool story. That was this episode. Mm-hmm. Very intense. Thanks, ladies. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, very intense. So you gotta, like, think of some maybe light, more lighthearted ones. Yeah. For the future. Um, well, if you guys want to check out our ghost feature of the week that is up on TikTok now, Jessica, what ghost did you do? Uh, I did the Grey Lady of the Halifax Citadel. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah, so go check that out. That is awesome. Um, our podcast is Histories and Mysteries Pod, just P-O-D. Um, so check that out. The link is in our link tree on our Perfect. Instagram. I link, I did, I put a link in there for our, um, TikTok profile. Perfect. Yeah. And then you can always find all of our links and um, all of our bios, except for Rochelle. We'll put hers on soon. And 
<laughs> coming soon. Coming soon to Spotify near you. On our website at historiesandmysteriespodcast.godaddysites.com. And please, if you could, rate or review us on any of your podcast listening platforms. We'd really appreciate it. You can really only do it on Apple right now, I think. Okay. Um, Because you can't do it on Spotify. And I don't think you can do it on Google. But if you can, it would be great. But any little rate or review helps us get noticed a bit more. So we very For appreciate sure. it. Yeah. And we look forward to bringing you two new stories next week. And we'll talk to you then. Bye. Bye. Bye.